They look like they have a blue dot on both of the lenses. I don't know what the purpose would be behind the madness of that, but I ain't no glasses expert, but it might be paint from Bible school, isn't it? Well, anyhow, somebody's glasses, Sigma. All right, take your Bible to us to the book of Micah. Jonah Micah. Amen. Thank the Lord for last week and what he done in Bible school. And great week in the Lord, amen. Appreciate all the help and work that was done. Just a good time, amen. Pray God would give an increase to all that was done. Amen. We're in chapter 13 in your book, 149, 151, somewhere around in there, I'm sure. If the pattern keeps up with these different printings of this book. Amen. God's discipline of darkness. Boy, it's, just, it's rough to be in the dark about things. <clears throat> but when God have cut the light down a little bit, and God always has a reason for anything that he does, but it don't mean it's easy, amen. So we're going to look at this discipline. God has several disciplines that we've looked at thus far. This is, you know, probably the... 12, I think chapter 1 was an introduction. 12 different types of disciplines, somewhere around in there. And this is another one where God will discipline his children because God's the teacher, we're the student, and he's trying to teach us. Micah chapter 7, look in verse number 8 is the text verse for this thought of God's discipline of darkness. Amen. Anybody got it? Amen. What's the first word there? Rejoice. We're talking about darkness, and the first word is rejoice. Rejoice not against me, O mine enemy. Micah talking about the enemy rejoicing against him, and he said, don't do it. When I fall, I shall arise. Thank God God's children can get up. Amen. When I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be a light unto me. Amen. When we fall, thank God we can arise, and when we're in darkness, God's promised to be our light. Amen. Let's pray and ask the Lord to help us. Tim Moody, how about pray for us? Amen. Help us, Lord. Amen, amen. We just have a few chapters left in this book, and then we'll be going in another direction in our adult class, but... We're looking at this discipline of darkness, amen. Peaceable fruit. And God wants fruit out of our lives. Hebrews chapter 11, uh, Hebrews 12, verse number 11, the poem to start of this chapter says this, What shall thine afterward be, O Lord, for this darkness and suffering night? Father, what shall thine afterward be? Has thou a morning of joy for me and a new, new and joyous light? What shall thine afterward be, O Lord, for the moan that I cannot stay? Shall it issue in some new song of praise, sweeter than sorrowless heart shall, could arise when the night had passed away? What shall thine afterward be, O Lord, for this helplessness of pain? A clear view of my home above? Of my father's strength and my father's love, shall this be my lasting gain? What shall thine afterward be, O Lord? How long must thy child endure? Thou knowest, tis well that I know it not. Thine afterward cometh. I cannot tell what, but I know that thy word is sure. What shall thine afterward be, O Lord? I wonder and wait to see. While to thy chastening hand I bow, what peaceable fruit must be ripen now, ripen fast for me. Amen. The afterward uh, of God's chastening is the fruit of righteousness. Amen. God has a plan to make us better. And no doubt in this discipline of darkness, it is God's plan. God has skills, skill to know what providence will make Christ dearest to thee. So salt so, so taught Samuel Rutherford and many of God's, children's, uh, God's children never learned this preciousness of, of Christ until they 
have under, undergone God's discipline of darkness. Amen. God will put you through something to make you better. And that's what all God's disciplines are for, to make us better. Amen. For his work. So the identified, Roman number one, what kind of darkness? Amen. will be the question, the answer. And where did it come from? Amen. Of course, we'll see this darkness that God's discipline, it comes from him. But there's several types of darknesses in the Bible. We'll look at some of them here. In Micah chapter 7, verse 8, the prophet speaks of darkness. Our first task, therefore, must be to identify the kinds of darkness to which the prophet refers. Many kinds of darknesses are mentioned in Scripture. Amen. Many kinds. Uh, look, first of all, let's see, uh, look in... Exodus chapter 10. Exodus chapter 10. Many darknesses. Amen. We'll look at one reference to There's several references to these darknesses. <clears throat> if you, you highlight them in your book there or if you're taking notes. <clears throat> Number one, there's the natural darkness of this present world. The natural darkness of the physical world. Exodus chapter number 10. Thus the psalmist exclaims in Psalms 104 verse 20, Thou makest darkness, and it is night. This natural darkness may be brought upon the world as a judicial punishment. For instance, in Exodus, there was an unnatural darkness. Look in Exodus 10, verse number 21. An unnatural darkness. The Bible says, uh, And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thine hand toward the heaven, that there may be a darkness over the land of Egypt even darkness which may be felt. This is one of the plagues that God puts on Pharaoh for having taken his people and put them in bondage and Moses has gone down to deliver them. But it's a darkness that may be felt. This darkness continued for the space of three days. You imagine being in that type of darkness that can be felt that long of time. There is an intimation in Roman, uh, Revelation chapter 16 verse 10 that there will be a similar period of darkness in the kingdom of the beast, amen, in the great tribulation period. So there's this natural darkness of the physical world, amen. Hey, it gets dark at night. And sometimes God puts darknesses like he did then and he'll do in the future in the tribulation on this old earth, amen. Number two, there's different kinds of darknesses in scripture. Number two, there's the darkness that is result, uh, or excuse me, the darkness of man's natural state, I should say. Man's natural state. Look at Ephesians chapter 5. Man's naturally in darkness. He was born in darkness. Born in sin. Amen. So man's got a natural darkness from birth. Ephesians chapter number 5. In verse number 8, the Bible says this in Ephesians 5, 8, about that natural darkness of man's natural state. He says, for ye were sometimes darkness. But now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. In the lost man's state, he has a natural state of darkness. Amen. As a lost person. Paul teaches in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 8 that before their conversion, the Ephesian Christians were sometimes darkness. Jesus spoke of man's natural darkness when he said, I am come a light into the world that whosoever should uh, believe it on me should not abide in darkness, John 12, verse 46. God knew this world was in darkness. So that's why he come to save, deliver us from that natural darkness in our natural state. This undoubtedly is the darkness referred to in the following passages. And so Acts 26, 18, Romans 13, uh, verses, uh, Romans 13, verse 12, 1 Peter 2, verse 9, 1 John 2, verse 8 and 9, many references, amen. So there's the natural darkness of the physical world. There's a darkness of man's natural state. But number three, there's a darkness as a result of intervenient sinning, amen, uh, where we just do wrong, amen. We don't obey the Lord. Look at that in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 18. It's one of the closest one there to where you're already at. The Bible said, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. You know, sin will blind you. This, the, the third, there is a darkness that is a result of inner, inner 
rate it sinning. Jeremiah warned the people, give glory to the Lord your God before he caused cause darkness and before your feet stumble upon the dark mountains. And while you look for light, he turn it into the shadow of death and make it gross darkness. What a sad day. You start looking for light, but God said, no, I'm cutting the light out. Your sinning has brought forth the darkness. And this is where people begin to walk in darkness, amen, and they begin to hate the light, John chapter number 3. Why? Because their sinning is the result of darkness in their lives, amen, darkness. While ye have light, believe in the light that ye may be the children of light, amen, darkness. God speaks of darkness, amen, this darkness. Other scriptures speak of darkness. Number four. There's the darkness that comes as a result of continual sinning is the darkness that is a result of rejecting light. So number four, there would be a, a darkness that is a result of rejecting light. The world's physically dark. A lost person's natural state is dark. Sinning brings forth darkness. And then you, you know what sin does? It just causes you to reject the light. And the rejection of light just brings more darkness. The old saying is light rejected it becomes lightning. The flash, this closely darkness is related to that continual sinning. It's rejecting light. The Lord Jesus warned the, his people in, in his own day, walk while you have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whether he goeth. It's sad day. You don't know where you're going. You rejected that light. God said, walk while you got light. There's coming a day you won't have it. Amen. Especially when you get into those days of sinning where you, God begins to dim down the lights in your life and you begin to stumble around like a blind person. And you're like, well, what, are, what are they doing? They're children of light. How could they be walking like that? Why? Because they have, uh, sin has turned out the lights and they've rejected the light that God's given them. It's caused them to walk and stumble around in darkness. The psalmist, too, spoke of those that sit in darkness in the, uh, in, and in the shadow of death because they rebelled against the word of, words of God and condemned the counsel of the Most High, Psalms 107, verse 10 and 11. This darkness is referred throughout the Scriptures. Amen. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, in whom the God of this world, little g, the devil, have blinded the minds of them that believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ should shine unto them. And they rejected that light. Many as lost people have, and now they're stumbling around. And even in some cases, God's children have rejected light. Now they're stumbling around in their darkness. Amen. Number five, different darknesses in the Bible. This is the darkness uh, of the satanic oppression. It's kind of like, they kind of like, compound on one another, if you will. Man naturally is in darkness as a natural state as a lost person. Amen. This world has a natural state of darkness to it. Amen. Run by the God of this world. There's a darkness that comes upon people because of their continual sinning and their rejection of the light, which brings on the darkness of a satanic oppression. You know, it's like God says, there's light for you if you'll be saved. And walk in the light as he's given you light, which is the word of God is a light lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Now, don't reject the word of God. Obey the word of God. But if you reject it, then it brings more darkness. And the more you reject it and the more you continue in a path away from God, whether it be in a lost person or a saved person, because both can do the same. It's choices that we make. You know what it brings on? It brings on a satanic oppression, which is surely darkness. It's like crossing the line. And that's where a lot of people get, and they get out there, and, in, and if they're lost, they just kind of go way over the hill. And then a uh, safe people that used to be in the light go way over the hill, and you wonder how in the world can they get that far in darkness? And the devil's just kind of like reeling it. And that satanic oppression comes in. Look in Colossians chapter number 1. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. I'll try to give you the references that are kind of close together. There's several references there. If you have a book, you see all the references. If you like the references that you don't have a book, we can get them to you. Amen. It's no problem at all. But there's a lot of references to these different thoughts. This darkness of a satanic oppression. Colossians chapter 1, 
Look in verse number 12. Uh, the Bible says uh, in verse 12, Give thanks unto the Father, which had made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who have delivered us from the power of darkness. What did he deliver us from? He delivers us from that satanic power over us and have translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Paul assures the Colossian believers that they have been delivered from the power of darkness. Facing the cross, the Lord Jesus told the chief priests and the captain of the temple and elders who came to arrest him that this is your hour and the power of darkness. That's what the Lord told them. Your hour, the power of darkness, Luke chapter 22, verse 53. So there's a satanic oppression that brings forth the darkness because Satan is the prince of the kingdom of darkness. It's his domain. It follows that this age is characterized by darkness. Look at this, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Look in verse number 4 and 5. This satanic world, it's oppression. We're talking about darknesses. We're talking about sometimes God's children will be placed in a darkness as a discipline type way to enhance their love towards the Lord and draw them closer to God. Sometimes that's even for judgment. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, look in verse number 4. The Bible said, But ye brethren, say people, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. You know God's people got no business stumbling around in the dark. If anybody's without excuse, it's God's people. And you had he quickened who were dead in trespasses in. God made us alive. God cut the light on in our soul and has given us the word of God to lighten our path and to show us where we stand and show us where we need to go. We are without excuse if we stumble in the dark. We have to voluntarily shut the light off. You know why we do it a lot of times? Because we think if we hide behind the darkness, nobody sees. But you can't cut it off. You can't make it dark enough where God can't see. God is light, and there's no darkness in him. It's Satan's domain to live in the dark. It's where people choose the darkness to do most of their evil, amen. That's what he describes in John chapter number 3. The Apostle Paul instructed the Thessalonian believers that they were not of the night nor of darkness. So number six, there's a sixth darkness in the, in the, in the Bible. This is the darkness of the grave. The scripture refers to the darkness of the grave. Job begs his friends to leave him alone. Listen to this. This is Job 10, verse 20 through 22. Are not my days few? Cease then. And let me alone, that I may take comfort a little. Before I go whence, I shall not return, even to the land of darkness and the shadow of death a land of darkness as darkness itself and as of the shadow of death without any order and where the light is as darkness. There's the darkness to the grave. Number seven, we're talking about different darknesses that the scripture describes. Number seven, there's a darkness of the eternal uh, perdition, perdition. Amen. Look at this in 2 Peter chapter number two. 2 Peter chapter 2. It's a little bit further towards the back there. Hebrews, James, 1 Peter, 2 Peter. The seventh darkness. You know, dark's just kind of depressing. I like the light. Don't you? I just like it, man. You, you turn on all the shades, or you want to sleep and be drowsy and dreary. Man, open the blinds. Let the light in. Shine. Amen. Clean. Amen. Darkness. The darkness of eternal perdition. 2 Peter chapter 2, look in verse number 4. The Bible says, For if God spared not the angels that sin, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into the chains of darkness, to be reserved in the judgment. Hell is described as a place of darkness, weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Look in verse number 17. He says, These were, are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest. 
to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. Well, that's a sad darkness. The darkness of eternal perdition. Number eight, there's another kind of darkness. And this is the darkness that we're speaking of in our text, if you will, the darkness of discipline. God disciplines his children. But there's another kind of darkness distinct from these other kinds of darkness already mentioned that God uses as a discipline in the lives of his children. This disciplinary darkness is referred to by many of God's saints in the scriptures. Look in Job 19, Job 19. This darkness of discipline. It's not because of sinning or, or being in hell or being oppressed by Satan, the natural state of an individual, but it's a discipline of darkness. Amen. Why would, you, you may be wondering, why, well, why would the world would God put anybody in darkness? We'll see a little bit, amen, and try to learn a little something from this discipline. Job is before the book of Psalms, right? Job, chapter 19. Look in verse number 8. Job 19, 8. Job answering his friends here. He said, He had fenced up my way that I cannot pass, and he have set darkness in my path. Job's speaking about the Lord. God fenced him up. God made it where he couldn't pass, and God have set darkness in his path. Amen. Job complains. He had fenced up my way that I cannot pass, and he had set darkness in my path. In Psalms 88, verse 6, the psalmist testifies, Thou hast laid me in darkness. In Lamentations, chapter 3, and verse 2, Jeremiah shares his sorrow. He said, He had led me and brought me into darkness, but not into light. Jeremiah professed it, Job professed it, the psalmist professed it, amen, that God had brought them in a darkness. It is possible to classify God's discipline of darkness into three categories. Number one, there's the intellectual darkness, intellectual. The darkness that believers experience may be intellectual. That is due to our ignorance. God often permits his children to go with many questions unanswered. You ever know, wonder why God do that? It's a darkness. It's an intellectual darkness. I've got no light on the subject. We are always shown the final plan. We, excuse me, we are not always found, shown the final plan. We see but the ends of the threads as they are being worked into the tapestry. We don't know what God's doing a lot of times. And so sometimes intellectually we're in darkness. You say, well, that's kind of bad for God to do somebody like that. You know, if you start being judgmental towards the Lord, surely you can take that kind of attitude. You know, I've been given a short end of the stick. God's treated me wrong. God's cut the light out on me. But you ever thought that maybe God's held back some things to better us in this discipline of darkness? There's the intellectual darkness. There's the mental darkness. Number two, the darkness that comes to a believer may be mental darkness. That is due to our infirmities. Some days the believer's experience may be as though a curtain has been pulled across the windows of the mind. This unwelcome gloom may be caused by a physical condition. Perhaps the believer is in, in need of rest and refreshment mentally. And sometimes you get wore out. And we're in darkness because there's no knowledge, because of a mental, mentalness, or maybe it's a spiritual darkness, number three, that the Christian may face. That is due to our immaturity. Sometimes we just don't know because we're immature spiritually. Often the day of the Lord and the believer's experience is a day of darkness and of gloom, a day of clouds and of thick darkness. As the morning spread upon the mountains, Joel chapter 2, verse 2. Yet, we must not judge the brightness of the day by the gloom of the early morning. You get up in the morning, you think, oh man, it's dark, it's rough. Hey, but don't judge the whole day by the gloom that you're facing at the moment. God knows when and how to turn the light on. 
And he knows why to bring down the shades in our lives. Let the sun, S-U-N, of righteousness arise, and these clouds will soon be scattered. Thus, when we have to say in the words of the prophet that all joy is darkness, Isaiah 24, 11. Isn't it amazing how much this book has to say about darkness and what God does through the darkness? And we experience like Abraham in Genesis 15, verse 12, and, and horror of great darkness. We must identify the experience as God's discipline drawing us to himself. Amen. And God knows what he's doing when he puts us in the darkness. God knows how to draw us close to him and maybe long for a little more light. Many of God's choices saints have written concerning the experience of darkness. Uh, Dr. J. Holden spoke, of, uh, spoke at the uh, Keswick Convention in 1915 on the text. In Psalms 104, verse 3, He maketh the clouds his chariot. In part, Dr. Holden said this, I find here a contradiction of the common idea that the darkness which settles down upon the soul is always the result of sin. That's what we think a lot of times. Well, if I'm in darkness, there's got to be something wrong. If I have no light on the path that I'm to tread, then maybe there's something wrong. In some cases, it is for that sake, and we've seen there are a lot of different ways that darkness could enter in our lives, but not all cases are sin. Sometimes God just kind of pulls the cloud over. Shadows on us. Sometimes it is, as each of us know, to its bitter regret that it is because of sin. But it is not always so. For there is direction in his word to those who walk in darkness and see no light while they are yet living in the obedience to the voice of his word. That they should stay them upon his faithfulness. Do not therefore hastily conclude that the darkness into which you may have been brought is necessarily evidence of sin. It may be far otherwise. That's good instruction. Because if we all have to admit, sometimes it just seems dark. And you've searched and you've confessed and you've, and you've, you've asked the Lord like the psalmist said, search me, try me, see if there be any wicked way in me. Lead me in the ways of everlasting. It seemed like all your prayers and all your Bible reading and all your faithfulness to the Lord, it just seemed like the shade's down. And we wonder why. Days get like that. I mean, that's not popular for the world of prosperity and everything always going great with everybody, but that's reality and that's Bible. In an editorial, The Ministry of the Night, the late Dr. A.W. A. Tozer wrote this. How long you continue in this night of the soul will depend upon any number of factors, some which you may be able to identify, while others will remain with God, completely hidden from you. The words in Psalm 74, 16 the day is thine, the night also is thine. Will now be interrupted for you, interpreted for you by the best of all teachers, the Holy Spirit, and you will know by personal experience what a blessed thing is the ministry of the night. We think, it's, man, if it's light and it's bright, everything's just so great, and that's where God's really ministering, but sometimes God ministers in the night. What the psalmist said, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will feel no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod, thy staff, they comfort me. Hey, even in the dark times, God's there, just as much as he is in the light. So the, we identified it. What kind of darkness? There's several kinds, but there's this disciplinary darkness. Who is it from? It's from the Lord. Number two, the interpreted. Amen. The meaning and the purpose, if you will. So if it's coming from the Lord, what is the meaning and the purpose for this discipline of darkness? Having identified God's discipline of darkness, the believer must then seek to interpret its meaning and purpose. In this matter 
of interpreting God's discipline of darkness, the believer must be careful lest he be led into an erroneous position which regard to the experience. What, what, what is the meaning of, the, of this and purpose of this darkness? What we need to understand a few things. Number one, our experience is not unique. <laughs> Look at this in 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. You know, we think sometimes, well, if I'm, I'm just the only one in the dark. I'm the only one don't know. I'm the only one in uninformed. I'm the only one struggling. It's not unique to you. Darkness happens to all. Even to those that you seem like are always joyous and everything's always going well on the outside, they experience it too. And God knows when to put us through it. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, you know the verse. There have no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. Everybody gets it. But God is faithful. Thank God for that. Who will not suffer you to be attempted above that you're able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape that ye may be able to bear it. First, the believer must not be led to think that the experience is unique with regards to the discipline of darkness as in the case of all God's disciplines. We need to bear in mind the apostolic instruction that there have no temptation taken you, but such is common to man. Other believers have undergone God's discipline of darkness. Therefore, the believer must not be led to think that his experience is completely unparalleled. Never take the attitude that I'm the only one. Nobody's the only one. The only one that can take the cause that I'm the only one of anything is God. He was the only one without sin. He's the only one. We're many of the same. So we must bear in mind that our experience is not unique. Number two, our experience is not unending. It will come to an end. That's good. Second, the believer is, who is undergoing God's discipline of darkness must not be led to think that his experience will be unending. Some believers do harm to themselves when they begin to think that the darkness has settled forever. Every tunnel has an end. And the believer will undoubtedly be brought back into the light of the day. It's not, it don't come to stay. Thank God that the phrase throughout the Bible, it come to pass. Number three, our experience is not unpardonable. Finally, the believer must not be led to believe that, the, that his experience is unpardonable. The believer must not become frantic and begin condemning himself for having committed some act of unbelief against the Holy Spirit, how then is this discipline to be interpreted? Now look in Hebrews chapter 12. How do we interpret it? What's the meaning? What's the purpose? What is God doing by disciplining me with some state of darkness? You know, the truth of the reality is that... that whether we want to admit it or not, but a lot of times we would never seek the Lord, pray toward the Lord, worship the Lord, and give the Lord the most if it wasn't for some type of tragedies in our lives that kind of cause us to fall on our back and look up and be dependent on Him. Sometimes the truth of the reality is it's the mountaintop experiences which they're great and we long for them and we can get a great view of the overview of what God would have us to do down in the valley. That's what these mountaintop experiences a lot of things are for. Uh, but we, 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 when we get like that, sometimes we don't pray like we should. We don't seek like we should. We don't serve like we should. It's God has to kind of dim it down a little bit to get us to back communion to him like we should, whether we want to admit it or not. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 6. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. He said, that just don't go together, love and chase. Yeah, that's what God is. And scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? There's never been one God that whooped. No matter how good you live, you've been whooped. <laughs> Amen. Uh, but if you be without chastisement, we're, matter of fact, we probably ain't been whooped as much as we should have been. 
God's long-suffering, very merciful. Verse 8, but if you be without chastisement, we're of all our partakers, then are you bastards and not sons. The only ones God don't beat are those that are not his. Furthermore, we have had fathers in our flesh which correcteth us, and, and we gave them reverence. You ought to do it to your natural parents. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? Capital F, Father, that's our Holy Father. For they verily for a few days chasten us for their own pleasure, but he, for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous nevertheless. Here is the results. This is the meaning and the purpose. Afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Verses 6 and verse 11 makes it very clear that God chastens and scourgeth his children, but he wants to yield forth the peaceable fruits of righteousness. We are told by a recent writer that for many years the most beautiful singing canaries were imported from the uh, Hazar Mountains of Germany during the First World War. However, when it was no longer possible to secure these birds from Germany, a dealer in New York thought of an idea by which he hoped to train ordinary canaries to sing just as sweetly. He had the songs of the German canaries recorded. And then he played them back to some choice domestic birds he had managed to raise. His efforts at first met with only limited success. Then suddenly one day he made a startling discovery. He found that if he covered the cage of the canaries with, uh, with big pieces of dark cloth, completely shutting out the light, the birds soon learned to sing like the famous German canaries on the recording. Many a Christian has learned, too, that God sometimes teaches his children to sing most sweetly when their way is dark and sunless. When God shuts us away from the things of this world, then it is that we can expect to appreciate more perfectly the matchless harmonies of heaven. Thank God he gave us songs in the night, Job 35, verse 10. Hey, God will bring down the shades, man, and we'll, we'll love the Lord way more than we've ever loved him. He knows, that's a discipline. God knows what he's doing. You think nobody would discipline anybody like that, but boy, when it brings forth the peaceable fruits of righteousness, is it not worth it all? Some of the sweetest testimonies and, and, and praises and glorifying to God is somebody that's came through a dark time in their life and God has been with them and carried them and delivered them is when they shout and praise God the most. Many times. We have heard of a man who was invited by an artist to come to his house to see a picture. He had just finished. When the visitor arrived, he was shown into a room which was pitch dark. And there he was left for a quarter of an, quarter of an, uh, an hour alone. He, he expressed surprise when the artist came in at the reception which he had given to him. Surprised are you, asked the artist. Well, I knew if you came into the studio with the glare of the street in your eyes, you would never be able to appreciate the fine color of my picture. Therefore, I left you in the dark till the glare had worn away from your eyes. Is that not the same thing the world would do to us? Is it not this, uh, this the secret of many of, of an hour in which God leaves his children in the darkness? When we are uh, dazzled by the pleasures and su uh, successes of this present life, we cannot see the things that are unseen and an interval, interval is necessary in the darkness until the glare has worn away from our eyes. Well, you start seeing how he well, heaven gets sweeter after that, don't it? The things of God become more precious. We identified the darkness of the different kinds and who it came from, the interpretation, the meaning, and the purpose. Let's look at this improved. Or how can we apply it practically to our lives? 
centuries ago, uh, the evangelistic preacher always sought to improve, as he termed it, the passage of Scripture they were expounding. What they meant, of course, was to turn to practical account to the truth of their text. Let us now seek to improve God's discipline of darkness. And we never kind of prove the scriptures. That term is just to expound or make it practical to your life. When we turn, number one, how do we, how do, we do it, amen, by, by accepting the discipline is from his hand. You've got to realize it comes from God. We turn God's discipline of darkness to practical account when we accept the discipline at his, uh, from his hand. Accept this discipline not uh, fatalistically, but faithfully in the light of the following scriptures. The Lord said that he would dwell in the thick darkness, 1 Kings 8, 12. That means he's there with you, right? Job 12, 22, he discovered deep things out of the darkness. Daniel 2 and 22, he knoweth what is in the darkness, and the light dwelleth in him. We improve God's, uh, we improve God's discipline of darkness when we reach for his hand. An anonymous writer shares with us his improvement of God's uh, discipline of darkness. He says this, There come seasons of darkness in all our lives, times when there is neither sun nor moon nor stars in the sky, and we stand still in fear or grope trembling. A few years ago there fell upon my life one of these seasons in which I could see neither the right nor to the left. A terror of darkness was upon me. One night I lay awake, thinking, thinking, until my brain grew weary with uncertainty. I could not see a step in advance, and fearing to move onward, lest with the next footfall I should plunge into hopeless ruin. Very strongly was I tempted to turn aside from the way in which I was going, a way reason and conscience approved as right. Something held me back. The old saying is, never, never doubt in the darkness what God has shown you in the light. Again and again, I took up and considered the difficulties of my situation. Looking to the right hand and to the left for ways of extraction, and inclining now to go in, in this direction, and now in that yet always held away from resolving inner convictions of right and duty that grew clear at the moment when I was ready to give up my hold on integrity. So the hours went heavy, heavily flooded until past midnight. My little daughter was sleeping in the crib beside my bed, but now she began to move uneasily and presently her, her timid voice broke frantically. Papa, she called. What is it, darling, I asked. Oh, Papa, it is dark. Take Nellie's hand. I reached out my hand and took her tiny one in my own, clasping it firmly. A sigh of relief came from her little heart. All her loneliness and fear were grown, gone. And in, a moment, and in a few moments, she was sound asleep again. Oh, my Father in heaven, I cried in a sudden, almost wild outburst of feelings. It is dark, very dark. Take my hand. A great peace fell upon me. The terror of darkness was gone. Keep hold of my hand, oh, my Father. I prayed fervently and thought I should be called to walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Let not my feet wander to the right nor to the left. Well, I'm glad we can hold his hand. We've got to accept the discipline is from him. Number two, let me say this and move on quickly. We got, we're out of time. By looking for the stars. Moreover, we improve God's discipline of darkness when we look for the stars. Night brings darkness, and darkness brings the stars. Alexander McLaurin's statement is true to the fact that we need to look for the stars of God's promises when we undergo God's discipline of darkness. How the promise began to glow when we are passing through the darkness. 
the promise of his peace, of his presence, of his pardon, of his power, of his purpose. These promises become to us a light that shineth in a dark place. Number three, by trusting God for the victory. In the text which stands at the beginning of the chapter in Malachi where we began, does not deny the possibility of going through a period of darkness, but he explains, when I said in darkness, the Lord shall be a light unto me. Micah was trusting God for the victory. David joins with Micah in 2 Samuel 22, 29, For thou art my lamp, O Lord, and the Lord will lighten my darkness. When God chases away the darkness from the believer's heart, the darkness is put under his feet. Through the prophet Isaiah, the Lord assures his people of his salvation and superintendence. I will make darkness like the light before thee. Again, in Isaiah 50, verse 10, we have the prophet's counsel to the believers passing through the period of darkness. Who is among you that feareth the Lord, that obeyeth the voice of his servant, that walketh in darkness and have no light? Let him trust in the name of the Lord and stay upon his God. The psalmist said in Psalms 120, 112, verse 4, Upon thy right, upon, uh, excuse me, unto the upright there arise light in the darkness. Fellow believer, you are presently passing through a period of darkness. Then is the light of God's word. You need first to identify the darkness is coming from God. Second, you must interpret its purpose. And finally, you must seek to derive personal blessings from the discipline. Thus, in the word, words of another, you may discover that your gloom, after all, is the shade of his hand outstretched carelessly. Boy, I'm glad he's faithful. He's a good God. Identify the darkness. God's discipline on you. There's a meaning and a purpose and it's very practical in our lives. Amen. You're not alone, but God will see you through. Amen. Yep. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word.